everyone. Welcome to our conversation with Helene Wecker for the Book Fest. I'm Jenna Bush, contributing author to Star Wars Psychology and 10 other books in the Psych Geek series, and I write all over the place online. You'll find me somewhere. Um, so Helene is the author of The Gollum and the Ginny, um, the upcoming and the upcoming The Hidden Palace, which is very exciting. Um, and the first book won the, and I'm going to try to pronounce this and not mess it up, uh, Mythopoic Award. How'd I do? I've heard it many ways. <laughs> okay, that's good. Um, the, the VCU Cabell Award, the Harold U. Ribolo Prize, and a nomination for the Nebula and World Fantasy Award, which is amazing. So welcome to our chat. Thank you very much. And I just want to know uh, people to know The Hidden Palace is actually out. It uh, came out in June. So you can get it now, which uh, which is very exciting. That's really cool because I went on Amazon and they were saying, oh, pre-order and they were listing 2022. So I'm very glad you said that. Oh, my goodness. Now. OK, I got to go check that out later. That's weird. OK, yeah, I want <laughs> to have that. Um, so let's start out with how you got into writing and when you knew this was the career you wanted. Oh, goodness. OK, I was um, one of the kids who was always scribbling Um and I, it's more, you know, everyone, <laughs> it's the old story. Um, so I was, uh, you know, I, I did a lot of creative writing, a lot of bad sci-fi and fantasy um, up through high school, lots of, um, you know, Star Trek fan fiction. Um, and then in college was when I started thinking, okay, well, obviously I can't do that for a living. Um, and you know, you got to think about your career when you come out and all of that. Um, <clears throat> so I graduated, uh, undergrad with, um, you know, an English degree and I immediately went into communications and spent about seven years in communications at, at various, uh, you know, either, you know, for profits, nonprofits. And at some point was like, okay, this, I can't do this anymore. It's just not me it wasn't um you know i was working at the time that i really had the switch i was working in a public television station in seattle um and it was a great place and great people and you know i really believed in what they were doing and still just couldn't deal with my job that i was like i'm writing press release after press release about other people's awesome documentaries and series and things that, you know, other people have spent years of their life building. And I want to build something too. Um, and that was when I started to think back to, okay, really, I, I need to try to be a writer. I need to try if, if that's, you know, if I'm on my deathbed, what are, what are my big, you know, regrets going to be? And that's going to be one of them. So I started taking some uh, night courses at uh, the local university and immediately, you know, within a few months was like, okay, I'm feeling like I put more of myself into like this short story than anything that I did over the last, you know, however many years of my career. So obviously this is something I need to pursue. Um, at that point, the TV station did me the marvelous favor of laying me off. Uh, so I had a, um, you know, I was like in my twenties and I had no mortgage and I had no kids and, you know, I had a boyfriend in an apartment. Um, <clears throat> so it was the perfect time. I was like, yes, thank you. So, um, I, and at that point I knew myself well enough that I was like, okay, I need to, I need an academic environment in order to really push myself. I want to be like surrounded by people who are doing the exact same work that I'm doing. Um, so I started to apply for MFA programs and uh, was utterly confounded when I got into Columbia in New York. Um, still can't believe they let me in. And then at that point, I I was like, that's it. And I moved across the country and I started uh, the grad program there. And that was two years of classes. Um, and at the end, they uh, have you, uh, you know, do a um, <laughs> the final project, but that's not it. It's a, a thesis. And, you know, for it's your grad thesis. And that what I turned in was um, partly part of it was like the first two chapters of the Golem and the Genie. 
that's really cool. And, you know, we're talking today about blending fantasy, mythology, romance, and horror. Um, we're often told that we're supposed to stick to one genre, maybe two. Um, and this is a lot of them. And so I'd love to talk a little bit about which you were drawn to first. Obviously, sci-fi, if you're writing Star Trek fan fiction, and Star Trek does, in a way, take a lot of mythology and romance and all of that and put it into the sci-fi genre. So, mm-hmm. so that the idea of ma- mashing these things together come about? So what happened was once I got to grad school, um, I don't know why it was, maybe it was the environment. It was certainly wasn't that pressure from like my other, my, my professors or students or anything, but I was writing in a very, I immediately started writing a very realist, um, uh, short story sort of collection that was about my family history, um, and my husband's family's history. I'm Jewish. He's Arab American. Um, His father is from Syria. And we met when I was like 18. And so we've been together for a very long time. And I, as I learned his family's history and his family stories, I, and, you know, and knowing my own family history, the, what had always struck me was the overlaps and the resonances between them specifically around immigration and coming to the U.S., um, so what I, and, and it, it intrigued me because it had always been, you know, like here are two cultures that are supposed to be like this, but in some ways our families had more in common with each other than, you know, our neighbors or their neighbors who, you know, been here since, you know, the, the 1800s or whatever, and were, you know, white Christians in the dominant culture and so on. Um, so there was, uh, there was immediately in our families like that sense of seeing each other. And so I wanted to write about that. And so I was writing about these, you know, these very realist short stories that were taken from, you know, actual episodes in our family history that I was sort of tweaking slightly in order to fictionalize them. And the problem I was running into as I was doing this was that they were, (laughs) they were just weren't very good. I was, I was writing these stories that, you know, I knew inside and out. And so it felt so, you know, even fictionalizing them, you know, just enough to, to get them on the page. It was like I was telling these stories that, you know, I told a million times or I just knew by heart. So they just didn't feel like they weren't exciting. They, they weren't something that was like flying off the page. Um, and the feedback I was getting from my workshop was pretty much telling me this as well. Like, oh, this is okay. Yeah. We're really, you know, we, we were interested, I guess, you know, but they weren't, you know, wasn't what I was hoping for. And I knew that too. It's like, you, you get to the point where you read your own work and it's like, Ugh, I wish this could be better. So I was complaining about it um, to one of my friends in the workshop and uh, we were like sitting on the, the steps outside of our class, uh, you know, after, um, after class. And I was just complaining. I was like, I really want these to be better. This is supposed to be my thesis. This is like the thing that you are taking into the world as you leave Columbia and you go off into the world of publishing. Um, and she said to me, Helene, can I ask you a question? Why are you writing these very Raymond Carver-esque, quiet domestic short stories that turn on these, you know, subtle emotions. When I know you and I've been to your apartment and I know what a nerd you are, I've seen your bookshelves, you are always talking about the use of the fantastical um, in in literary fiction and you are, you know, this this is your wheelhouse. This is what you do. So why aren't you writing like that? And it was just this total like head snapping 180 of like, oh, uh, I honestly don't know. Um, but what about the stuff that I'm doing now? You know, and she said, okay, the next thing I see from you in your workshop, it can be about your families, but I want it to be fantastical. And I was like, okay. So <laughs> it was like, she gave me this like free therapy on, on the steps. Um, or life coaching, I guess. So I went back to the apartment and I sat down. I was like, okay, so what if instead of the Jewish girl and the Arab American boy that had been threading through these stories, 
what if we switch them up and what if we like turn them into the most like folkloric emblematic creatures what if we let neil gaiman this up here and we make them a golem and a genie and i pretty much instantly saw them they were like this this tall woman um who had you know she was you know, sort of dark haired and very, she, she looked like a strong, tall woman, but she was very shy. <clears throat> and I saw this, this equally tall man who was very like good looking and seemed like a bit of a bad boy. I was like, Ooh, okay. What do I do with you two? Um, and it instantly, because of, because of the, um, because now that it felt more like folklore or fable, it felt like an older story to me. It wasn't like the sort of mid 1950s and up that I was, you know, had been working with before. I was like, okay, you feel turn of the century to me. And if you two are going to meet anywhere, it's going to be in New York. It's going to be in New York at the, the it's sort of in the heyday of immigration, um, like when everyone is pouring through Ellis Island and you've got like these islands in uh, New York, which is slightly true now, is still true, but was much more true back then of like, here is, you know, the, the, the six blocks per ethnicity. And if you walk outside that, you can't read the signs anymore in your own language. Um, so that to me just felt like what that was. And I was like, OK, let's see what I can do with you guys. And I just started typing and within, you know, by the end of the day, I had like the first dozen pages of what turned out to be the Golem and the Genie. And I took it to workshop and, you know, they read it and got back to me and said, okay, this is much better than what you've been doing before and much more interesting. So, you know, good on you. Um, but you, th I told them this is a short story and they said, this isn't a short story. This is a novel. And I was like, uh, <laughs> no, it's not. I can't write a novel. I'm, 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 you know, doing this other stuff. And so I figured I'd just finish the short story and I kept writing and writing and writing and writing and writing and writing. And the short story just kept getting longer and longer. And at some point I realized they were right. This was a novel. And now it was like, I had to bring in everything because I've been sort of eliding or hand waving some of the historical details, the folklore details, the, you know, the, 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 the true, you know, trying to figure out who these characters really were at their heart and what they believed in. And, you know, in a short story, you can, especially if you have like a, a, a high enough level that you're sort of telling it from, you can make time move really fast. You can have them sort of be um, not as defined characters. You can have them be a little mysterious, but the, once it's a novel, it's like, no, this is, this is, we need to know who these people are, how these people live, what it is they believe in, what their problems are, what it is that they are trying to get out of life. And so that was really when the mashup, like the mashup sort of happened at the very beginning of the, um, uh, of, of the process, but then all the consequences of that and all of like the knock-on effects started to really pile in. And it was like, okay, I have to go to the library <laughs> And I'm going to sit there for a year and I'm just going to read everything I can and figure out like, okay, he's a genie, but what does that mean? You know, there are so many kinds of gin. There are, you know, I, I read the, the Thousand One Nights. I read, you know, folklore stories that I found in old journals. I found all sorts of stuff. Um, and then I had to decide from all of that what my version was going to be while still like being respectful as much as, you know, I could to, you know, someone else's culture. Um, but it's something you got to pick the rules. Um, and then, you know, for, for the golem, like, okay, how, you know, golems traditionally are like these giant lumbering things uh, that don't speak and are sort of like Frankenstein's monsters. Well, obviously that's not going to work for a main character. So how am I going to make her empathetic? How am I going to make her understand the people around her? Um, and so that, ended up, uh, uh, you know, determining some of her personality. And then that, you know, those things sort of interacted with the, um, with the, uh, the setting and the time period, because, you know, especially for like a female golem and in 1900, it was a very, very rest restrictive time for women. Um, and so there's only so much that she can do. 
in terms of a career, in terms of just, you know, going outside by herself after dark, you know, that's no, no, you're a prostitute if you do that. So it, it's in that, you know, and then I had to solve those problems. So like the whole mashup just sort of, honestly, it wasn't like, who what if I, you know, bring in this and what if I bring in this? It was, what is the, what are the actual real life consequences going to be from this situation that I've set up? Oh, I love that. I, I, the research, research is my favorite part of all of this. And, um, do you, do you think you have a, like a specific set of, say specifically for the gin, a specific set of stories that probably weighed the most heavily, um, on listing your character? Good question. Um, you know, I, the funny thing is, I think in the end, it wasn't the Thousand and One Nights so much, uh, even though that's like the the classic, you know, everyone knows, you know, some version of those stories. Um, it was this journal that I found from like 1915 um, of, uh, um, gosh, they were prop, what would you call them? Uh, like adventurers, uh, sociologists, um you know, people, ethnologists, I guess, early ethnologists, I don't think that that category really existed as such back then. But um, basically, Americans or, or, or Brits who had gone to um, Lebanon and were collecting folk tales uh, from like the mountain villages of Lebanon. And the and, you know, the, you know, these are you know, sort of poor translations and there's probably a bunch of um you know, cultural stuff that's, you know, getting missed in the, in, in translation and, and, but, but at the same time, you know, this was what I could read. I don't, you know, I can't read Arabic. Uh, so this is what I could read from back then. And it was really interesting stuff because it wasn't about, um, you know, this genie who did this stuff. It was about living side by side with the unseen world. Um, it was, you know, y- you leave out something for them at night. You know, you you don't go to the places where they're known to be because then they piss you off and then they possess you. You don't, you know, it was just this sense of like, here is this other world that is, you know, unseen, but that we interact with and we have to follow their rules. Um, and that's where I got the, the stuff about um, iron uh, being, uh, you know, iron amulets that people would wear, um, to sort of ward away the gin and ward away evil gin in, in uh, specific, um, which I thought was a really cool detail because it, it's the same in some respects as, um, like the, the fairy, like the tales of fairy in England and, and, uh, you know, the British Isles about, um, iron being sort of the, uh, the embodiment of, of, of man and industrial progress and the stuff that will come and rip away the forest and rip, you know, sort of rip their natural environment apart. And so there's that, um, sort of sense of the, the wild versus the, um, you know, the, this, of men, uh, human civilization and, and just sort of butting up against each other and, and each have the power to affect the other. Um, so yeah, some that I think was mostly in the end what ended up influencing was was just these um, these stories of yeah here's what you do to you know keep on their good side. And in terms of the the Gollum side, it's interesting mm-hmm. because most of the stories, at least that I've read, I've never seen a female. Mm-hmm. It's, always been, it's always been a male character, and I I love the idea that that this is this is a woman who's also a Gollum. So. Were there specific stories there that you found? So the one golem story that I had read before um, before I started writing the book that had a female golem in it was a short story by um, a writer named Naomi Kritzer, who, funny enough, I went to college with. And she uh, wrote this story about a lesbian couple in World War II Prague who... Um, creates a female golem to protect themselves from the Nazis. And I've never seen a female golem before. And it turns out there's a few stories from the Talmud here and there about rabbis. <laughs> one, one in particular, there was a, a rabbi that had made a, a golem out of twigs because he didn't have a wife and he needed someone to clean his house. 
And then like the, <laughs> and then the, the townspeople got suspicious and because they're like, there's like some woman in there with the rabbi and is he living in sin? And, you know, and so he invited them in and showed them the golem and, and then like in front of them deactivated her and she just fell into this pile of twigs so that he could prove to them that he wasn't actually, you know, didn't have the woman shacked up in there with him. And it was, it was such a, a, a story of like, one, you know, the the machines we create for our convenience and two, how we feminize those machines in order, you know, he was doing the domestic work. work. Well, it's a golem. Well, it can't be a guy golem because a guy golem wouldn't sweep the floor. That's a woman's job. So we're going to create the category of female golem, which is just so amazing to me in order to like, you know, have someone that would sweep the floor where, where we're not like, like emasculating a creature that we've created. It, it's just, it's just, anyway. Um, so, <laughs> um, so, you know, all of that gender stuff, then because I had made that decision to create a female golem, all that gender stuff gets wrapped up in it too. And, and, and she has to live by women's rules, which are different than men's rule. And, you know, and that creates a, a, a friction between the two of them and, and they end up having a lot of discussions about it. And so that, you know, ends up just adding more fuel to, to the book. Yeah. It's, I, I find that fascinating. It also reminds me of the, um, the argument when we had our first female doctor who, and everyone said, well, women can't time travel. I'm like, but, but hmm, okay. Heart is full of bras, right? That was <laughs> yeah. Yeah, like, so I, I very much appreciate that. Um, so it's it's interesting. I was actually going to ask you about the restrictions on her gender and that particular time period. I mean, do you think because we often we often set fantasy in times where we have more to sort of butt up against. Did that mm -hmm. did that help you the restrictions with this character or or did you have to fight against them? You know, sort of both. Because it was like it did the restrictions restricted me too. Um, in what I could do with her. And especially once I realized what, you know, the, the, that socially women were just not allowed to walk around after dark, which was something I hadn't known, um, you know, before I did the research. Um, I just didn't know that much about turn of the century, you know, American society. Um, and so once that happened, I was like, okay, I, I set it up so that these two characters don't sleep. Neither of them have to sleep. And I was like, okay, so what is she going to do all night in her apartment? What can I have her do in her apartment all night long if she's she, she can't just be sitting there? She'll go, you know, she'll go insane. And I was like, oh, wait. Oh, she'll go insane. That's interesting. I can work with that. So I had that, like, that anxiety that sort of builds in her if she's in her room for too long. And then, you know, because she is, you know, a creature made for work. And so she has, you know, she needs to go out and work and her body stiffens up, but she's, um, you know, still for too long. Um, and so I had that be the setup, for the relationship between um, her and the genie that he would visit her once a week and take her out walking uh, at night. Because if you're with a man, you're obviously you're okay. It's just if you're alone that it's a problem. And so they're just another anonymous couple on the street when they're together. And and that became the framework for their relationship. So it was one of those like constraints provide structure um, in, in the same way that, you know, a sonnet, you know, the structure of a sonnet, uh, you know, creates this, the, the poem. Um, and so it, it it did limit, but it also, it, it's like closed doors and open them at the same time. So, and, and that sort of happened over and over. It was, it was a really interesting process of discovery that way. So, you know, it, in terms of mashing up genres, like love stories and the, the romance genre can sort of weave its way into anything. Mm -hmm. um, but the romance genre by itself has some baggage, just even looking recently watching the show Nine Perfect Strangers, you have a romance novelist who's everything you expect a romance novelist to be. So how did you balance 
the love story versus the um, the mythological or the, the fantastical elements? That's a really good question. Um, how I balanced it, I think, was that I wanted it to be real. I wanted it to feel, and, and that's not a knock on romance novels, um, because I love reading like a good pop boiler romance and, you know, with all the tropes and all of the, you know, uh, all of, all of the falling into bed and, you know, panting at each other and first sight and stuff. But that's not what I wanted this to be because I had sort of determined that once, once I had these two characters who were very, you know, supernatural plopped into the real world, they were going to operate by real world conventions. And to me, what that felt like, and it, I wanted them to have a full relationship where they are discovering each other and getting to know each other and maybe being a little leery of each other at the fir at first because what the heck are you? You know, I don't know. They, they, they can tell from the first moment they see each other that they are, you know, that the other is not human, but they have no knowledge of what that other thing, that other person is. And so that's going to take a lot of getting used to at the same time that they are getting used to this new environment of, of New York. This is like weirdness piled on weirdness. So I knew that I was going to have to break that down and have them get to know each other slowly and get to trust each other slowly to when there does at, at the point at which there does start to be hints of, of romance, it feels earned. It feels like a long road that they have traveled to get to that place. And so I, I think the, the way that I balanced it was honestly just taking this, having it take its time and having it thread in slowly, 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 having that structure of seeing each other once a week at night certainly helped because it, New York at night became their world together. It was the thing that they explored together. And so this was what they shared. And it, they so through the book, through the first book, they develop like places start to have meaning places. They start to accrue meaning for each other singularly and as a couple. And so they have um, this, this world that they travel through and that brings them together as much as, you know, they, they argue a lot in, in, in the, especially you know, in both books, but certainly when they're getting to know each other, they argue a lot because they come at the world from such different perspectives. And so that's how they get to know each other too. Is just, they just walk through the city and they argue a lot and they talk about basically the meaning of, of their lives and how they are supposed to fit in with all these, you know, like totally screwed up humans around them. Um, and so I, I, I guess maybe that, that probably reflects on me in some way that my idea of a good romance is to argue about philosophy while you're walking around. Um, but, <laughs> you know, it's, it's a way to live. So, um, so that was, you know, and then just by the end, you know, when things start to fall into place, the plot, the romance, everything, it all just sort of rushes together because it took so long to build up. But then it like hits this critical mass and just starts, you know, just like running downhill toward the end. You know, uh, one of the the things that was written about your book, they they compared the horror aspects of this to Mary, what you what you've done to Mary Shelley, which, by the way, not a bad compliment to get. Um, <laughs> good. So, but I, but I am really, really curious about that. I mean, did you, did you take something from the idea of, of the creation of life of, of, of a creature from Mary Shelley? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't know how much I took from Mary Shelley specifically. Um, I mean, certainly I've read Frankenstein. I love Frankenstein's. I was honestly, it's been popping up in my life again so much, just references specifically to Mary Shelley that I'm like, I got to read it again because it's been a while. It was like, you know, college, I think the last time I read it. Um, but I think more is that her story, you know, what she was doing was very much of her time and it, 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 it pulled in the sensibilities of her time. But it also exists on a continuum of, you know, going back to those Talmudic golem stories and before any any story, you know, the the, the 
is it Prometheus? I, I don't, you know, any stories in every myth and, and culture of like people who try to take the powers of gods onto themselves and create life. And they almost, but not quite, you know, and then what is it that's lost in the gap? What is it when you, you know, quote unquote, say God, what, you know, how much of a human can you create? Um, and that runs all the way through, you know, from Golan stories up through Mary Shelley, all the way through Star Trek, you know, Commander Data, you know, the Battlestar Galactica and the Cylons, all the way through to, you know, Asimov, modern times. It's fantasy and it's um, science fiction. It just depends on what point in the, you know, on, on the timeline you're looking at it. Um, and so I, you know, she was certainly a touchstone, but the the, the stories you know, go back farther than that. And they go far uh, forward from that too. Yeah. I, I love that. And particularly that day, I just actually rewatched the data episode, the measure of a man. Oh um, God, that's so good. Yeah. yeah so, oh, it's so heartbreaking. Oh. It really is. It really is. And that just, because you're a Star Trek fan, like I, I very much appreciate that in your, in mm -hmm. your writing. And, but you know, I'm curious because one of the things about, about mashing up genres is, is, having a balance and did you find even like during your revision process during your different drafts um did you find yourself taking things out putting things back in to keep that balance oh yeah with everything um and a lot in the in the beginning specifically um the uh, hava the the golem uh the first few like i don't know the first year or two i was working on the book she did not have that um, her ability to uh, sort of read her empathic ability uh, to, you know, hear other people's emotions and desires and fears. Um, so it, it, what happened was she, the, the comments that I was getting back were, we, we like the character, but she's too much of a robot. We haven't, she isn't, um, I, I, she doesn't understand what's going on around her. And that makes and the, the readers were saying that makes people that, that makes us impatient with her because why you know we understand why she can't figure out that this guy's in love with that woman and that's why he's acting so weird um but because we know when she doesn't it makes her seem um less she has less agency and she's just sort of in the dark all the time and that becomes very hard as a reader to stay patient with and i was like okay okay so how am I going to correct for that? How can I make her be, you know, still a golem, um, but, you know, have a little more understanding of what's going on around her? And that's when I gave the, the, the conceit is that since her, um, her master died when she was newly brought to life, she can't feel the connection with him anymore. So she has sort of like, she's, she's just like taking in radio signals from everyone around her. And, and she, you know, everyone's her master just a little bit and she understands what they're, what they're sensing. Um, and so she, what she has then is, okay, this guy is acting funny about that woman because he's in love with her, but what is love? And why are, why are they feeling those things? And is that something that I could ever feel as a golem? And so it becomes, you know, it brings things in a little closer to her that she understands them, but there's still that gap between them and that, you know, that narrowed things down. So that was one thing definitely that changed. Um, I also just, you know, had conversations with my, um, my early readers about, okay, at what point are they too alien? At what point are they too powerful? At what point, you know, I can't give them this ability in chapter five, if they could have gotten out of a situation in chapter three, if they'd known they had it. So there's a lot, there was a lot of tweaking, a lot of, I mean, this is one of the reasons the book took so long to write was that it was just like endless tweaking of, of, okay, you know, setting up the rules and setting up the situations and making it so that, um, you know, everything was consistent. That took a lot, that took a lot of energy. <laughs> yeah. Do you have like a, a board where you list your rules? Do you have, or is that just something that you, <laughs> I've always wondered about that because I usually have 80 post-it notes behind me. Oh my gosh. I have tried every method. I had oh, boards, I had post-it notes, I had, um, you know, mind map software, flowchart software, every, I use, um, one thing that I do use that has been sort of consistently useful, there's an app called Eon Timeline. Um, that you, that actually just got a really awesome update. 
um, where you can plot, you know, on a time on, you know, an actual timeline, um, any number of events and you can have them in different arcs and different sections. So the way I've got mine set up is okay. At the top, it's like world history of, you know, 1900 on this day, this happened. Uh, and then under that is New York. Uh, so, you know, specific to New York, what was going on in the city so that, you know, I knew when it was, um, you know, just, just interesting things that I've, that I found in research that I might want to throw in. Um, and then, uh, below that was the characters and you could have each one plotted. And so you can sort of see when things are lining up and like, oh, this came really, this became like a real useful and also a problem um, during the second book while I was plotting it out because I've got a lot of run up to World War I. Um, and what was happening and I've got people sort of all over the world. I've got people, uh, you know, journeying in, in different, you know, in the Middle East and then having to come back to the West. And what was happening during the um, while stuff was going on in, in the Middle East and the Mediterranean, um, but the U.S. wasn't in the war yet, was it was getting very hard to travel. It was, you know, you could you maybe you could get out on one boat and get, you know, to England, but no one was crossing the Atlantic once the U-boats started patrolling. And and so it became, you know, and then there's the Lusitania sinking. And 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 so it, you know, having to line everything up and, and feeling like, you know, I've got everything pinned to this world history. And so it, things were starting to bunch up and it felt like everyone's just sort of sitting there, you know, waiting for the Lusitania to go down and then Lusitania goes down and then everything, all the action starts up again. You know, it, it just sort of, you know, I, and, and I had to change around a lot of stuff and it's just too much detail, but it's sort of the, uh, the hard parts of, of writing historical fictions. You have to you have to deal with the world as it actually existed. You can't move a war. It just, you know, someone will yell at you. You'll get email. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. You can't move a war. <laughs> you, you can't. It's hard. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, uh, balancing even, I mean, obviously you've got genres that you're balancing, but you're also balancing mm -hmm. world history and and how much of that you put in versus the character story. Did that, mm -hmm. did that sort of change over time? Yes, especially the second book, because it did have a lot. The second book takes place um, over 15 years. The first book is one year. The second book is 15. And so there's a lot. And it's a pretty momentous stretch of world and American history. It's from 1900 to 1915. And I can't write a book that's 15 times as long as the first book. So obviously there's stuff I'm going to have to compress and elide. And then it, it became, okay, choosing the events I was going to write about and what was going to be more resonant within the characters' lives and sort of forward their stories or the themes. So I ended up with um, the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire in New York uh, that happened in 1911. Um, that be, has a sort of central, it, it's, it, it's not totally central to the, the story. It happens in the middle of the story and there's fallout from it, um, within the characters' lives. Um, and part of that is also, if you're writing a book set on the Lower East Side of New York in that time period, you have to write about the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire because it was just, it was just a defining moment in a lot in New York, um, and in, a lot of people's lives and there, you know, so many lives lost and, and so much that came out of that in terms of, you know, the labor movement, um, and women's rights. And, um, uh, it gave a boost to a suffrage and, and so on. And so that, you know, it's like, it's like ignoring the pandemic. If you're writing about 2020 and you just can't do it. Um, so one thing that became difficult though, writing about these events without having the events take over. It's like, okay, so how am I going to write about some, you know, am I going to have people standing there staring up at a burning building? That just doesn't, then it becomes about the building as, you know, and the, and the depths as it should be, but then it starts to feel lurid. You know, it's like, I'm sort of exploiting these people in order to get my characters to move, you know, in a particular direction. So what I ended up doing was doing a lot of it um, sort of either slightly off screen. So, you know, something's happening, but there's other stuff going on at the same time or told in flashback. Um, and that, to, that was 
that ended up being a better way to do it than, you know, having people standing there staring up at a burning building and women like jumping out of buildings. Like, no, I just, that's just, you know, there's no good way to do that unless that is the thing that the story is about. And it wasn't, it was about these other people. So, so yeah, that just learning how to write delicately around that stuff took a few drafts. I appreciate that because I wrote a comic about the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire. So oh. I know what you mean that like balance between the the like shock value of it and the actual people's story is it's, yeah. a, it's very, very kind of delicate. And you know, I I one of the things about genre that's interesting is pitching. Trying mm-hmm. to like explain when you're when you're pitching this to somebody and say, like, well, it is a love story or it is a fantasy, it's historical, like. When you're, what was your pitching process like? How did you describe this? Um, yeah, I, I know exactly what you mean because it's like what I try to, I go to, you know, I meet someone and then I'm a writer. Well, what do you write? Okay, well, I have to like, give you, <laughs> how do you describe this, you know, succinctly and make it not sound like you know, an utter mess? Um, so the, the pitch process actually, the, the, the the true like pitch moment for this book happened while I only had like a few chapters of it, funny enough, um, because I was, it was back at Columbia. Um, and one thing that they do when, when you're a student that they have is um, this, it, it's called agent night. It's the agent mixer. Um, and all the professors sort of bribe and browbeat their agent friends into um, coming to campus for a night and you all gather in this room and it's sort of like the high school dance um, where it's like agents on one side and, and, and writers on the other. And there's there's a bunch of alcohol in the middle. And eventually someone, <laughs> one of the writers will drink, you know, get enough courage in them to go and start pitching. And, you know, hi. And you, you shake a lot of hands and you tell people about your work and and, you know, then they uh, if they like what you're saying, they give you a business card. Uh, and say, well, when you're, you know, send me what, when, when you're done, send it to me and we'll talk. And, you know, that's sort of your, your entree. It's like, then when you get the thing ready, you've got the business card and you can email them and you can say, we met on this night. Would you please like to read my manuscript, please? And so what happened was I was, you know, I had literally like 50 pages of the book at that point. And I'm like, okay, I got nothing to lose here. I, I'm just going to walk around and practice pitching and collect some cards. And so I'm doing that. And, I'm, and people are like, oh, okay. So, you know, you know, what do you write? And I'm, well, I'm working on a, a book about a female golem and a male genie who meet in turn of the 20th century New York. And it's about immigration and, uh, you know, acculturation. I, I said, it was something like that. And people go, ah, okay, I haven't heard that one before. Here's a card. Okay. And then I got to this guy um, who I told him the story and he just sort of like sat back and he said, can you send me what you got? And I was like, uh, I feel like I've been rumbled, you know, because I don't really have much. <laughs> so I was like, I've only got like 50 pages. And he said, send it to me. And so I did. And we ended up having... Um, and he, he like read it and he got comments back to me. And then he said, when you have more, send it, I'd like to see it. And so we had this like years long correspondence where I would send him pages and he would, you know, give suggestions and write back. And it was like, he, he was like my main reader. And then we got to the point where he was like, okay, so, um, I think you've got enough that we can sell this. So um, you like to sign on with me? And I was like, oh, okay. And that was the easiest way anyone has ever gotten an agent ever. And I completely jumped over the whole like cold emailing flop sweat, check your inbox a million times a day sort of thing. And I feel very guilty about it because I know a lot of writer (laughs) friends, writer friends who spent years in there. And I'm like, I'm sorry, I got an agent so fast. <laughs> um, but that was really how it how it happened. And then he took it to auction. And he had been what I realized at some point was that he'd been like telling editors about this thing that he had like in his back pocket. And for if he ever got me, would they be interested in the book? And so like it just all happened so fast once I had a certain amount. And then I was like, 
I don't know what just happened. I guess I sold my book. Um, and that was, it was, it was amazing. That is so cool. But, you know, before we wrap up, I'd, I'd love to, because you've, you've done this successfully to the point where they are comparing you to Mary Shelley. So that's, I would say you, you've hit success there. <laughs> um, so, and, and with all the awards and the nominations and everything, what advice do you have in terms of genre mashups and just writing in general for new writers? <sighs> um, genre mashups and new writing for new writers. I think the thing with the mashup is don't just smash things together to, to because no one's done it before. Have a reason. Have have a why. What is there? There's a um, the book, uh, the Amazing Adventures of Cavalier and Clay by um, Michael Shabon. Um, he's there's a one point there that it focuses on a couple of comic book writers. Well, one's a writer and the other's an artist. And people are like his friends are coming to him with ideas like, it's it's this it's like a guy, but he transforms into a shoe, and you know, but and he he came. The, the sentence he eventually came up with was, what is the why? What is the point? What, what is it about this particular transformation, about this particular otherness that is going to tie into something deeper and fuel a character, fuel a story? Be thinking about the characters and not like the setup. Um, you know, sometimes the setup creates the characters and that's how you got get to the character. But it has to be character driven. It has to be some longing, some uh, you, displacement, something that is going to create enough friction um, to to propel it forward. Um, so that I think would be like my mashup advice for new writers. Um, I think the, the advice that I tend to give, which sometimes surprises people, um, especially for like younger writers who are, you know, in their... I don't know, 20s, 30s. Um, if you're going to get partnered up, be partnered with someone who understands what you're doing and believes in it. Um, that is something that has been a huge, huge part of why I've been able to write um, and why I've been able to take the time to write, even as a uh, as a as a wife, as a parent. Um, as someone who's like, you know, trying to live in the community and not just be, you know, in, in a cave writing, um, is that it's, you know, get someone, get someone who, if you're going to have kids is going to take care of the kids with you. Um, that's, <laughs> that's what I, my advice is, um, because it's very easy, especially when you, if you aren't making any money, if you, if you're, you know, getting a bunch of rejection letters, um, it's very easy to just sort of say, well, okay, this isn't, obviously going anywhere and there's all this other stuff I should be doing. And, you know, my partner's the one making the money and I need to make some money too, which yes, I mean, that's a real world consideration, but someone who is willing to give you the space to do what you need to do, um, that that's crucial. That is fantastic advice. So before we wrap up, tell everybody where they can find you and your work online. Um, well, you can find me on Twitter um, at Wecker H. It's either at Wecker H or at Helene Wecker. I can't ever remember which one it is, um, but I'm the only Helene Wecker on Twitter that I know of. So just search for me and I'm there. Um, and then also Instagram. Um, my website is HeleneWecker.com and that's got um, updates uh, of when I am uh, you know, doing stuff like this, or, uh, you know, hopefully once we get back into doing things in person, um, I'll be going to different places, uh, and, and the, my site will show you where you can find me. Um, so yeah, that's about it. That's awesome. And you guys can find me, um, all over the internet at, at Jenna Bush, B-U-S-C-H, like the beer, not the president. Helene, thank you so much for doing this today. Thank you very much for having me on. This was a lot of fun. <laughs>